Hello, and welcome to this second episode of Season 7 of The Dark Money Files, in which we shine a light into a murky world. I am Ray Blake, and with me is my co-host, friend, and business partner, Graham Barrow. Hello, Graham. Hello, Ray. Graham, I see we're going to be delving into the National Defence Authorisation Act, the NDAA, today. That sounds quite weighty. I think weighty is the right word, Ray. The full act runs to 1,480 pages. Uh, Well, presumably we're not going to review all of it then. Uh, Not unless you've got several weeks to spare, no. Which I haven't. Uh, I guess we're going to be homing in on the Corporate Transparency Act, which forms part of the larger legislation, doesn't it? Uh, Yes, it does. And yes, we are. Uh, Actually, it forms part of Division F, which is subtitled Anti-Money Laundering, and which starts, Ray, on page 1160 of the 1,480 pages. So the changes weren't just about corporate transparency then? No, they weren't. They also covered areas such as improved coordination and information sharing, modernising the AML and CDF laws to adapt to new and emerging threats. Uh, It's about encouraging technological innovation and enhancing the risk-based approach, along with requiring uniform beneficial ownership information. And that's the bit we're going to focus on today. Although I have to say that the rest all sounds very interesting as well. Well, it does, and well, maybe we'll come back later for another review. But our part is called Title 64, Establishing Beneficial Ownership Information Reporting Requirements, but which has a short title of Corporate Transparency Act. Yeah, I'm, I'm not quite sure of the logic behind the full and short titles, because they don't actually seem to relate in any way much. Mm. But anyway, that's what they are. Uh, And right at the outset, there are some jaw-dropping statistics. Like? Like the fact that there are more than 2 million corporations being formed every year in the US. Every year? Mm. Blimey. And and up to now, no requirement to disclose who owns them. Well, so it seems. The legislation says, and I'm quoting, most or all states do not require information about the beneficial owners of corporations. That's, if you don't mind me saying, Ray, that is a bit vague mm. for a piece of legislation, isn't it? It's either one or the other, but most or all seems a bit imprecise. <laughs> well, it suggests they're really not sure. That's not a great place to be, is it? Uh, No. No, it's as far away from transparency as it's possible to get, I would say, Graham. Um, The Act goes on to say that malign actors, its phrase, uh, use this fact to launder money. Oh, you don't say. Mm, Not just that. They do it through layers of companies, quote, like Russian matryoshka dolls, it actually says in the Act. I think we've used that expression ourselves before. So, yeah. But it's in the Act, so they don't just use standard legalese in their Acts, then. Well, apparently not, and maybe they listen. Uh, the Act also says they use secrecy locations for these layers, so each layer takes an eternity to unravel. Revelation after revelation. Mm. And then it lays out the reasons for enabling the capture of beneficial ownership information. OK, which is... To set a clear federal standard, protect vital US interests and better enable critical efforts to counter AML and CTF. Good. Anything else? Oh yes, to bring the US into compliance with international standards. (laughs) Oh yes, a little matter of being some years behind the rest of us. But then they go on to say that beneficial ownership information is sensitive information and will only be directly available to those authorised to access it. Ah, not not us then. Well, I don't imagine we fall under that category, Graham, so no. Oh, not like in the UK where the information is held to be in the public interest and therefore available to the public. And to be fair, a number of jurisdictions. Nope. Mm. Ah, shame. Well, who can view it then, Ray? Uh, National security, intelligence and law enforcement agencies, along with financial institutions who can access the information to meet their compliance requirements. 
Well, it's a start. Mm. Uh, let's let's hope as the US see more and more stories emerging from other parts of the world that clearly demonstrates how open and free to access beneficial ownership information can hugely contribute to the detection and prevention of financial crime and that they will move further along the road to opening up their own register. Yeah. Uh, now, we should talk about what documents are going to be acceptable as verification of identity. Well, we should. and And they are... A non-expired US passport, officially issued ID, driver's licence, or in the absence of any of those, a non-expired foreign passport. Ray, do you mind taking a quick and not wholly irrelevant diversion? Uh, of course not, Graham. Always welcome. Uh, what did you have in mind? Well, the US and passports makes for a fascinating story, Ray. Now, I've seen lots of statistics about how many Americans hold a passport, and it seems to vary a lot. Well, exactly. So I thought I'd do a bit of research. And? Well, the number of passport holders in the US increased from 27% in 2007 to 42% by the most recent Ooh. measure. And that compares to, say, Canada with 66% and the UK here with 76%. Quite a big increase, but still relatively low in comparison with other developed economies. Yeah, but there's more. Mm. For one thing, I didn't know that until the passing of the Intelligence Reform and Terrorism Act in 2004, American citizens didn't need a passport to visit Canada, Mexico, Central and South America, the Caribbean and Bermuda. I didn't know that either. No, and although the Act was passed in 2004, it took until 2007 to implement it. So the increase was potentially less to do with people who hitherto hadn't travelled abroad suddenly deciding they wanted to. More likely that those who only travelled within the Americas now need a passport to do so. Well, I think that's an entirely reasonable supposition. And then, Ray, I found some fascinating research published in The Atlantic magazine. Uh, which said? Well, it said there were huge geographic and demographic differences in the rates of passport holders within the US. Now, intuitively, Graham, I'm not surprised, but I'd love to hear more. Ray... Geographically, you're most likely to hold a passport if you live in California, New York State, New Jersey or Connecticut. Oh, oh, and Alaska, but I think that's something of a special case. Um, and between six and seven out of ten residents in those places hold passports. OK, so that's kind of broadly the international average. Uh, and least likely? Uh, well, Mississippi, Missouri, Louisiana, Alabama, Tennessee and Kentucky and between two and three residents in those states hold passports. What, two and three residents in the whole state? Oh, sorry, <laughs> that was not my best piece of English. I'll try that again. Yeah. No, I think I meant right, between two and three out of t each ten residents oh, right. state <laughs> hold passports. Yeah, yeah. OK. Yeah. Uh, so that's already telling something of a story. Uh, what else? Mm. Well, there is a strong correlation between education, income and passport holding. Not altogether surprising. And a negative correlation with what we might call blue collar workers. Yeah, that's almost certainly not the case here in the UK, where large numbers of people with manual jobs or other non-clerical occupations still like to holiday abroad as much as anyone else. Yeah, I suspect there's an economic impact here, as it's much cheaper to go to Spain for a few weeks from the UK than maybe the equivalent trip from some of the poorer US states. Fair point. Anything else? Yeah, there's a considerable correlation between diversity, both ethnic and sexual. Uh, states with high incidence of passport holders are also highly diverse. All of which suggests that providing passport ideas, being part of uh, a beneficial owner, is going to be easier for some than others. I agree, but realistically the ones it will be easier for are probably more likely to become beneficial owners of legal entities anyway. Hmm, interesting. And as you say, not entirely irrelevant. Well, not entirely. Um, but anyway, but back to the subject matter in hand. Now, in the Act, Ray, how is a beneficial owner defined? Ah, now, this is where things get a bit trickier. There are a number of definitions, although not necessarily very precise ones. For example, the first definition is, quotes, exercises substantial control over the entity. OK, but no definition as to what that means in practice. 
Um, no, although it wouldn't be the only national legislation anywhere in the world uh, that, that, that took that course. Um, then there's, quotes owns or controls not less than 25% of the ownership interests of the entity. Ah, oh. mm. or to put that another way, owns 25% or more, mm -hmm. uh, which is out of line with, say, the EU and here in the UK, which uses more than 25%. Exactly, Graham. Um, it may only be one share difference, but also potentially the difference between three UBOs and four. Which will matter a lot to firms who have a global footprint. Uh, precisely. Minor children are excluded from this definition, by the way. Oh, do they have the legal capacity to own or control shares in an entity? Uh, I can't answer that question for the US, Graham. I don't know. Um, mm. Nominees are also excluded, along with custodians, intermediaries and agents. Which I take to mean you have to disclose the true underlying owner, although it begs the questions, how will you know? Uh, they won't be the first to ask that question either. Uh, no. no. Uh, and then there's a lot of technical information about what is and isn't a, quote, reporting company. Um, which means one that has to disclose their beneficial ownership information. And I do mean a lot of technical information. OK, well, it, it wouldn't be a legislative act without a lot of technical information, I guess. Uh, no. And there's a lot more around who can access the register and how they do so. I bet there is. Uh, what else? Well, bearer share companies are explicitly banned, Graham. Oh, good. Mm. Right. Um, what about companies that have already been incorporated? According to the legislation, they have a time limit of two years from the date of the Act to meet its requirements. OK, so if I was being cynical, which, let's be honest, I have a tendency to be... Dodgy mm. entities have therefore got two years to remove names they would rather hide from the public view and insert those it considers more acceptable or palatable. Uh, that's one way of looking at it, yes. Uh, sadly, that's my way of looking at it. <laughs> um, um, what about changes to beneficial ownership once registered? The Act provides for a period of one year to report such changes. And how would they know if there had been a change? Well, that's a very good question, Graham. Uh, you seem to be implying that a company might incorporate with one set of names and subsequently change to a different person. Well, yes, I think I probably am implying that, although it's a problem not unique to the US. No. Um, but if, if, say, they banked outside of the US, you may not have access or indeed reason to access the lack of updated information, whereas on a public register, like the one here in the UK, it, it takes but a few seconds to check. In fact... It, as you know, it's now a requirement here in the UK to check to see if the ownership information provided by a client matches what is on the PSC register. Yeah, something non-US firms might find very difficult if they bank a US entity. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, is there anything else in the overall NDAA that caught your eye? Uh, yeah, there's an explicit instruction for the Treasury to undertake a threat assessment in money laundering by the People's Republic of China. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, and also a requirement post-assessment to compile a strategy to counter Chinese money laundering, along with a time limit of a year to complete the work. Hmm. Well, uh, it's a matter of public record that the Trump administration was pretty hawkish in its relationship with China. Do you think that's a remnant of that? It would be easy to typify it in that way, but I think it represents something deeper. Hmm. I mean, we've certainly... Right, he'd be made aware of a deepening interest in Chinese money flows and the underground banking system they use in China recently. And we've also commented on a number of occasions on the extremely large number of companies being formed here in the UK, which are either dissolved without filing any commercial activity or which consistently year after year file dormant accounts. Uh, and when we say large number, we're talking in the tens of thousands here, aren't we? Well, yeah, we are. And, and all of them using only a very small number of registered addresses and a handful of incorporation agents. And where have we heard that before, Graham? Don't start me off, Ray. <laughs>
Uh, yeah, no, I know better. Um, um, well, I, I think that's probably as far as we can go today. Uh, so what's hmm. next, Graham? Well, Ray, we spoke recently, didn't we, about illicit financial flows and the reliance many people still place on a now quite aged report by the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, the UNODC. Ah, yeah, now that's the one with the 2 to 5% of global GDP figure in it, isn't it? It is, but there have been some interesting papers published recently, not least one from the UNODC laying out a conceptual framework for the statistical measurement of illicit financial flows. Now that sounds interesting. Well, it does to us. (laughs) (laughs) And a fair few of our listeners, I would warrant... Well, I agree. I think there there was also a a report published in 2020 by the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, the UNCTD, with respect to illicit financial flows emanating specifically from Africa, some of which, of course, end up here in the UK, Mm. often via the private education route. I think this is a topic that is ripe for discussion. I'm looking forward to it. 